Nation State, Wikipedia article audio. A nation state in the most specific sense is a country where a distinct cultural or ethnic group inhabits a territory and have formed a state that they predominantly govern. It is a more precise term than country, but of the same general meaning, being that it is an ethnic nation with its own land and government. Complexity History and Origins Before the Nation State Characteristics In Practice Exceptional Cases United Kingdom Kingdom of the Netherlands Israel Pakistan Minorities Urdentism Future Clash of Civilizations Historiography Notes A nation, in the sense of a common ethnicity, may include a diaspora or refugees who live outside the nation-state, some nations of this sense do not have a state where that ethnicity predominates. In a more general sense, a nation-state is simply a large, politically sovereign country or administrative territory. A nation-state may be contrasted with This article mainly discusses the more specific definition of a nation-state, as a typically sovereign country dominated by a particular ethnicity. The relationship between a nation and a state can be complex. The presence of a state can encourage ethnogenesis, and a group with a pre-existing ethnic identity can influence the drawing of territorial boundaries or to argue for political legitimacy. This definition of a nation-state is not universally accepted. All attempts to develop terminological consensus around nation resulted in failure, concludes academic Valerie Tishkoff. Walker Connor discusses the impressions surrounding the characters of nation, state, nation-state, and nationalism. Connor, who gave the term ethnonationalism wide currency, also discusses the tendency to confuse nation and state and the treatment of all states as if nation-states. In Globalization and Belonging, Sheila L. Crouch discusses the definitional dilemma. The origins and early history of nation-states are disputed. A major theoretical question is, which came first, the nation or the nation-state? Scholars such as Stephen Weber, David Woodward, and Jeremy Black have advanced the hypothesis that the nation-state did not arise out of political ingenuity or an unknown undetermined source, nor was it an accident of history or political invention, but is an inadvertent byproduct of 15th-century intellectual discoveries in political economy, capitalism, mercantilism, political geography, and geography combined together with cartography and advances in map-making technologies. It was with these intellectual discoveries and technological advances that the nation-state arose. For others, the nation existed first, then nationalist movements arose for sovereignty, and the nation-state was created to meet that demand. Some modernization theories of nationalism see it as a product of government policies to unify and modernize an already existing state. Most theories see the nation-state as a 19th-century European phenomenon, facilitated by developments such as state-mandated education, mass literacy, and mass media. However, historians also note the early emergence of a relatively unified state and identity in Portugal and the Dutch Republic. In France, Eric Hobsbawm argues, the French state preceded the formation of the French people. Hobsbawm considers that the state made the French nation, not French nationalism, which emerged at the end of the 19th century, the time of the Dreyfus Affair. At the time of the 1789 French Revolution, 
only half of the French people spoke some French, and 12-13% spoke the version of it that was to be found in literature and in educational facilities, according to Hobsbawm. During the Italian unification, the number of people speaking the Italian language was even lower. The French state promoted the replacement of various regional dialects and languages by a centralized French language. The introduction of conscription and the Third Republic's 1880s laws on public instruction, facilitated the creation of a national identity, under this theory. Some nation-states, such as Germany and Italy, came into existence at least partly as a result of political campaigns by nationalists, during the 19th century. In both cases, the territory was previously divided among other states, some of them very small. The sense of common identity was at first a cultural movement, such as in the Folkish movement in German-speaking states, which rapidly acquired a political significance. In these cases, the nationalist sentiment and the nationalist movement clearly precede the unification of the German and Italian nation-states. Historians Hans Kohn, Leah Greenfeld, Philip White and others have classified nations such as Germany or Italy, where cultural unification preceded state unification, as ethnic nations or ethnic nationalities. However, state-driven national unifications, such as in France, England or China, are more likely to flourish in multi-ethnic societies, producing a traditional national heritage of civic nations, or territory-based nationalities. Some authors deconstruct the distinction between ethnic nationalism and civic nationalism because of the ambiguity of the concepts. They argue that the paradigmatic case of Ernest Renat is an idealization and it should be interpreted within the German tradition and not in opposition to it. For example, they argue that the arguments used by Renat at the conference What is a Nation? are not consistent with his thinking. This alleged civic conception of the nation would be determined only by the case of the loss gives Alsace and Lorraine in the Franco-Prussian War. The idea of a nation-state was and is associated with the rise of the modern system of states, often called the Westphalian system in reference to the Treaty of Westphalia. The balance of power, which characterized that system, depended on its effectiveness upon clearly defined, centrally controlled, independent entities, whether empires or nation-states, which recognize each other's sovereignty and territory. The Westphalian system did not create the nation-state, but the nation-state meets the criteria for its component states. The nation-state received a philosophical underpinning in the era of Romanticism, at first as the natural expression of the individual peoples. The increasing emphasis during the 19th century on the ethnic and racial origins of the nation, led to a redefinition of the nation-state in these terms. Racism, which in Boulainvilliers's theories was inherently anti-patriotic and anti-nationalist, joined itself with colonialist imperialism and continental imperialism, most notably in pan-Germanic and pan-Slavic movements. The relation between racism and ethnic nationalism reached its height in the 20th century fascism and Nazism. The specific combination of nation and state expressed in such terms as the Volkisk Staat and implemented in laws such as the 1935 Nuremberg Laws made fascist states such as early Nazi Germany qualitatively different from non-fascist nation-states. Minorities were not considered part of the people, and were consequently denied to have an authentic or legitimate role in such a state. In Germany, neither Jews nor the Roma were considered part of the people and were specifically targeted for persecution. German nationality law defined German on the basis of German ancestry, excluding all non-Germans from the people. 
In recent years, a nation-state's claim to absolute sovereignty within its borders has been much criticized. A global political system based on international agreements and supranational blocs characterized the post-war era. Non-state actors, such as international corporations and non-governmental organizations, are widely seen as eroding the economic and political power of nation-states, potentially leading to their eventual disappearance. In Europe, during the 18th century, the classic non-national states were the multi-ethnic empires, the Austrian Empire, Kingdom of France, Kingdom of Hungary, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire and smaller nations at what would now be called sub-state level. The multi-ethnic empire was a monarchy ruled by a king, emperor, or sultan. The population belonged to many ethnic groups, and they spoke many languages. The empire was dominated by one ethnic group, and their language was usually the language of public administration. The ruling dynasty was usually, but not always, from that group. This type of state is not specifically European, such empires existed on all continents except Australia and Antarctica. Some of the smaller European states were not so ethnically diverse, but were also dynastic states, ruled by a royal house. Their territory could expand by royal intermarriage or merge with another state when the dynasty merged. In some parts of Europe, notably Germany, very small territorial units existed. They were recognized by their neighbors as independent, and had their own government and laws. Some were ruled by princes or other hereditary rulers, some were governed by bishops or abbots. Because they were so small, however, they had no separate language or culture, the inhabitants shared the language of the surrounding region. In some cases these states were simply overthrown by nationalist uprisings in the 19th century. Liberal ideas of free trade played a role in German unification, which was preceded by a customs union, the Zollverein. However, the Austro-Prussian War, and the German alliances in the Franco-Prussian War, were decisive in the unification. The Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire broke up after the First World War, and the Russian Empire became the Soviet Union after the Russian Civil War. A few of the smaller states survived, the independent principalities of Liechtenstein, Andorra, Monaco, and the Republic of San Marino. Legitimate states that govern effectively and dynamic industrial economies are widely regarded today as the defining characteristics of a modern nation-state. Nation-states have their own characteristics, differing from those of the pre-national states. For a start, they have a different attitude to their territory when compared with dynastic monarchies, it is semi-sacred and non-transferable. No nation would swap territory with other states simply, for example, because the king's daughter married. They have a different type of border, in principle defined only by the area of settlement of the national group, although many nation-states also sought natural borders. They are constantly changing in population size and power because of the limited restrictions of their borders. The most noticeable characteristic is the degree to which nation-states use the state as an instrument of national unity, in economic, social and cultural life. The nation-state promoted economic unity, by abolishing internal customs and tolls. In Germany, that process, the creation of the Zollverein, preceded formal national unity. Nation-states typically have a policy to create and maintain a national transportation infrastructure, facilitating trade and travel. In 19th-century Europe, 
the expansion of the rail transport networks was at first largely a matter for private railway companies, but gradually came under control of the national governments. The French rail network, with its main lines radiating from Paris to all corners of France, is often seen as a reflection of the centralized French nation-state, which directed its construction. Nation-states continue to build, for instance, specifically national motorway networks, specifically transnational infrastructure programs, such as the trans-European networks, are a recent innovation. The nation-states typically had a more centralized and uniform public administration than its imperial predecessors, they were smaller, and the population less diverse. After the 19th century triumph of the nation-state in Europe, regional identity was subordinate to national identity, in regions such as Alsace-Lorraine, Catalonia, Brittany and Corsica. In many cases, the regional administration was also subordinated to central government. This process was partially reversed from the 1970s onward, with the introduction of various forms of regional autonomy, in formerly centralized states such as France. The most obvious impact of the nation-state, as compared to its non-national predecessors, is the creation of a uniform national culture, through state policy. The model of the nation-state implies that its population constitutes a nation, united by a common descent, a common language and many forms of shared culture. When the implied unity was absent, the nation-state often tried to create it. It promoted a uniform national language, through language policy. The creation of national systems of compulsory primary education and a relatively uniform curriculum in secondary schools, was the most effective instrument in the spread of the national languages. The schools also taught the national history, often in a propagandistic and mythologized version, and some nation-states still teach this kind of history. Language and cultural policy was sometimes negative aimed at the suppression of non-national elements. Language prohibitions were sometimes used to accelerate the adoption of national languages and the decline of minority languages. In some cases, these policies triggered bitter conflicts and further ethnic separatism. But where it worked, the cultural uniformity and homogeneity of the population increased. Conversely, the cultural divergence at the border became sharper, in theory, a uniform French identity extends from the Atlantic coast to the Rhine, and on the other bank of the Rhine, a uniform German identity begins. To enforce that model, both sides have divergent language policy and educational systems. In some cases, the geographic boundaries of an ethnic population and a political state largely coincide. In these cases, there is little immigration or emigration, few members of ethnic minorities, and few members of the home ethnicity living in other countries. Examples of nation-states where ethnic groups make up more than 85% of the population include the following. The notion of a unifying national identity also extends to countries that host multiple ethnic or language groups, such as India. For example, Switzerland is constitutionally a confederation of cantons, and has four official languages, but it has also a Swiss national identity, a national history and a classic national hero, Wilhelm Tell. A multinational state, where no one ethnic group dominates, a city-state which is both smaller than a nation in the sense of large sovereign country and which may or may not be dominated by all or part of a single nation in the sense of a common ethnicity, an empire, which is composed of many countries and nations under a single monarch or ruling state government, a confederation, 
a League of Sovereign States, which might or might not include nation-states, a federated state which may or may not be a nation-state, and which is only partially self-governing within a larger federation. Albania The vast majority of the population is ethnically Albanian at about 98.6% of the population, with the remainder consisting of a few small ethnic minorities, Armenia. The vast majority of Armenia's population consists of ethnic Armenians at about 98% of the population, with the remainder consisting of a few small ethnic minorities, Bangladesh. The vast majority ethnic group of Bangladesh are the Bengali people, comprising 98% of the population with the remainder consisting of mostly Bihari migrants and indigenous tribal groups. Therefore, Bangladeshi society is to a great extent linguistically and culturally homogeneous, with very small populations of foreign expatriates and workers, although there is a substantial number of Bengali workers living abroad, China, the vast majority of China's population is Han making up 92% of the population. https slash slash simple dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash Han Chinese Han population is geographically distributed on the eastern side of China. Also have very small percentage of Turks, Tibetans, Mongols, and others, Egypt. The vast majority of Egypt's population consists of ethnic Egyptians at about 99% of the population, with the remainder consisting of a few small ethnic minorities, as well as refugees or asylum seekers. Modern Egyptian identity is closely tied to the geography of Egypt and its long history, its development over the centuries saw overlapping or conflicting ideologies. Though today an Arab people, that aspect constitutes for Egyptians a cultural dimension of their identity, not a necessary attribute of or prop for their national political being. Today most Egyptians see themselves, their history, culture and language as specifically Egyptian and at the same time as part of the Arab world, Estonia, defined as a nation-state in its 1920 constitution, up until the period of Soviet colonialization, Estonia was historically a very homogeneous state with 88.2% of residents being Estonians, 8.2% Russians, 1.5% Germans, and 0.4% Jews according to the 1934 census. As a result of Soviet policies the demographic situation significantly changed with the arrival of Russian-speaking settlers. Today Estonians form 69%, Russians 25.4%, Ukrainians 2.04%, and Belarusians 1.1% of the population. A significant proportion of the inhabitants are citizens of Estonia. Around 7.3% are citizens of Russia and 7.0% as yet undefined citizenship, Greece. 91.6% of the permanent residents are ethnic Greek, the remaining 911,929 inhabitants consist of immigrants from Albania, Bulgaria, Romania, former USSR, Western Europe, and the rest of the world, Hungary. The Hungarians people consist of about 95% of the population, with a small Roma and German minority, see demographics of Hungary, Iceland. Although the inhabitants are ethnically related to other Scandinavian groups, the national culture and language are found only in Iceland. There are no cross-border minorities as the nearest land is too far away. See Demographics of Iceland, Ainu, an ethnic minority people from Japan, Japan. Japan is also traditionally seen as an example of a nation-state and also the largest of the nation-states, with population in excess of 120 million.
It should be noted that Japan has a small number of minorities such as RYKY peoples, Koreans, and Chinese, and on the northern island of Hokkaid, the indigenous Ainu minority. However, they are either numerically insignificant, their difference is not as pronounced or well assimilated. Lebanon, the Lebanese Arabs comprise about 95% of the population, with the remainder consisting of a few small ethnic minorities, as well as refugees or asylum seekers. Modern Lebanese identity is closely tied to the geography of Lebanon and its history. Although they are now an Arab people and ethnically homogeneous, its identity oversees overlapping or conflicting ideologies between its Phoenician heritage and Arab heritage. While many Lebanese regard themselves as Arab, some Lebanese Christians, especially the Maronites, regard themselves, their history, and their culture as Phoenician and not Arab, while still other Lebanese regard themselves as both, Lesotho, Lesotho's ethno-linguistic structure consists almost entirely of the Basotho, a Bantu-speaking people, about 99.7% of the population are Basotho, Maldives, the vast majority of the population is ethnically Tahivhi at about 98% of the population, with the remainder consisting of foreign workers, there are no indigenous ethnic minorities. Malta, the vast majority of the population is ethnically Maltese at about 95.3% of the population, with the remainder consisting of a few small ethnic minorities. Mongolia, the vast majority of the population is ethnically Mongol at about 95.0% of the population, with the remainder consisting of a few ethnic minorities included in Kazakhs. North and South Korea are among the most ethnically and linguistically homogeneous in the world. Particularly in reclusive North Korea, there are very few ethnic minority groups and expatriate foreigners. Poland, after World War II, with the genocide of the Jews by the invading German Nazis during the Holocaust, the expulsion of Germans after World War II and the loss of Eastern territories. 96.7% of the people of Poland claim Polish nationality, while 97.8% declare that they speak Polish at home. Several Polynesian countries such as Tonga, Samoa, Tuvalu, etc., Portugal, although surrounded by other lands and people, the Portuguese nation has occupied the same territory since the Romanization or Latinization of the native population during the Roman era. The modern Portuguese nation is a very old amalgam of formerly distinct historical populations that passed through and settled in the territory of modern Portugal, native Iberian peoples, Celts, ancient Mediterraneans, invading Germanic peoples like the Swabi and the Visigoths and Muslim Arabs and Berbers. Most Berber-slash-Arab people and the Jews were expelled from the Iberian Peninsula during the Reconquista and the repopulation by Christians, San Marino, the Samarinese make up about 97% of the population and all speak Italian and are ethnically and linguistically identical to Italians. San Marino is a landlocked enclave, completely surrounded by Italy. The state has a population of approximately 30,000, including 1,000 foreigners, most of whom are Italians, Swaziland, the vast majority of the population is ethnically Swazi at about 98.6% of the population, with the remainder consisting of a few small ethnic minorities. Netherlands proper, Aruba, Curaçao, St. Martin Innumerable conflicts have arisen where political boundaries did not correspond with ethnic or cultural boundaries. After World War II in the Josip Broz Tito era, nationalism was appealed to for uniting South Slav peoples. Later in the 20th century, 
after the breakup of the Soviet Union, leaders appealed to ancient ethnic feuds or tensions that ignited conflict between the Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, as well Bosnians, Montenegrins and Macedonians, eventually breaking up the long collaboration of peoples. Ethnic cleansing was carried out in the Balkans, resulting in the destruction of the formerly socialist republic and producing the civil wars in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1992-95, resulting in mass population displacements and segregation that radically altered what was once a highly diverse and intermixed ethnic makeup of the region. These conflicts were largely about creating a new political framework of states, each of which would be ethnically and politically homogeneous. Serbians, Croatians and Bosnians insisted they were ethnically distinct although many communities had a long history of intermarriage. Presently Slovenia, Croatia and Serbia could be classified as nation-states per se, whereas Macedonia, Montenegro and Bosnia and Herzegovina are multinational states. Belgium is a classic example of a state that is not a nation-state. The state was formed by secession from the United Kingdom of the Netherlands in 1830, whose neutrality and integrity was protected by the Treaty of London 1839, thus it served as a buffer state after the Napoleonic Wars between the European powers France, Prussia and the United Kingdom until World War I when its neutrality was breached by the Germans. Currently, Belgium is divided between the Flemings in the north and the French-speaking or the German-speaking population in the south. The Flemish population in the north speaks Dutch, the Walloon population in the south speaks French or German. The Brussels population speaks French or Dutch. The Flemish identity is also cultural, and there is a strong separatist movement espoused by the political parties, the right-wing Vlaams Belang and the new Vlaams Alliantai. The Francophone Walloon identity of Belgium is linguistically distinct and regionalist. There is also unitary Belgian nationalism, several versions of a Greater Netherlands ideal, and a German-speaking community of Belgium annexed from Germany in 1920 and re-annexed by Germany in 1940-1944. However these ideologies are all very marginal and politically insignificant during elections. China covers a large geographic area and uses the concept of Zhonghua Minzu or Chinese nationality, in the sense of ethnic groups but it also officially recognizes the majority Han ethnic group which accounts for over 90% of the population, and no fewer than 55 ethnic national minorities. According to Philip G. Roeder, Moldova is an example of a Soviet-era segment state, where the nation-state project of the segment state trumped the nation-state project of prior statehood. In Moldova, Despite strong agitation from university faculty and students for reunification with Romania, the nation-state project forged within the Moldavian SSR trumped the project for a return to the interwar nation-state project of Greater Romania. See Controversy over Linguistic and Ethnic Identity in Moldova for further details. The United Kingdom is an unusual example of a nation-state due to its claimed countries within a country status. The United Kingdom, which is formed by the Union of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, is a unitary state formed initially by the merger of two independent kingdoms, the Kingdom of England and the Kingdom of Scotland, but the Treaty of Union that set out the agreed terms has ensured the continuation of distinct features of each state including separate legal systems and separate national churches. In 2003, the British government described the United Kingdom as countries within a country. While the Office for National Statistics and others describe the United Kingdom as a nation-state, others, 
including a then Prime Minister, describe it as a multinational state, and the term home nations is used to describe the four national teams that represent the four nations of the United Kingdom. Some refer to it as a union state. There has been academic debate over whether the United Kingdom can be legally dissolved as it is normally recognized internationally as a single nation state. English law jurist A.V. Dicey from an English legal perspective wrote that the question is based on whether the legislation giving rise to the union, one of the two pieces of legislation which created the state, can be repealed. Dicey claimed because the law of England does not acknowledge the word unconstitutional, as a matter of English law it can be repealed. He also stated any tampering with the Acts of Union 1707 would be political madness. A similar unusual example is the Kingdom of the Netherlands. As of October 10, 2010, the Kingdom of the Netherlands consists of four countries. Each is expressly designated as a land in Dutch law by the Charter for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Unlike the German Lander and the Austrian Bundeslander, Landen is consistently translated as countries by the Dutch government. Israel was founded as a Jewish state in 1948. Its basic laws describe it as both a Jewish and a democratic state. According to the Israel Central Bureau of Statistics, 75.7% .7 of Israel's population are Jews. Arabs, who make up 20.4% of the population, are the largest ethnic minority in Israel. Israel also has very small communities of Armenians, Circassians, Assyrians, Samaritans, and persons of some Jewish heritage. There are also some non-Jewish spouses of Israeli Jews. However, these communities are very small, and usually number only in the hundreds or thousands. Pakistan, even being an ethnically diverse country and officially a federation, is regarded as a nation-state due to its ideological basis on which it was given independence from British India as a separate nation rather than as part of a unified India. Different ethnic groups in Pakistan are strongly bonded by their common Muslim identity, common cultural and social values, common historical heritage, a national lingua franca and joint political, strategic and economic interests. The most obvious deviation from the ideal of one nation, one state is the presence of minorities, especially ethnic minorities, which are clearly not members of the majority nation. An ethnic nationalist definition of a nation is necessarily exclusive, ethnic nations typically do not have open membership. In most cases, there is a clear idea that surrounding nations are different and that includes members of those nations who live on the wrong side of the border. Historical examples of groups who have been specifically singled out as outsiders are the Roma and Jews in Europe. Negative responses to minorities within the nation-state have ranged from cultural assimilation enforced by the state, to expulsion, persecution, violence, and extermination. The assimilation policies are usually enforced by the state, but violence against minorities is not always state-initiated, it can occur in the form of mob violence such as lynching or pogroms. Nation-states are responsible for some of the worst historical examples of violence against minorities not considered part of the nation. However, Many nation-states accept specific minorities as being part of the nation, and the term national minority is often used in this sense. The Sorbs in Germany are an example, for centuries they have lived in German-speaking states, surrounded by a much larger ethnic German population, and they have no other historical territory. They are now generally considered to be part of the German nation and are accepted as such by the Federal Republic of Germany, 
which constitutionally guarantees their cultural rights. Of the thousands of ethnic and cultural minorities in nation-states across the world, only a few have this level of acceptance and protection. Multiculturalism is an official policy in many states, establishing the ideal of peaceful existence among multiple ethnic, cultural, and linguistic groups. Many nations have laws protecting minority rights. When national boundaries that do not match ethnic boundaries are drawn, such as in the Balkans and Central Asia, ethnic tension, massacres, and even genocide, sometimes has occurred historically. Ideally, the border of a nation-state extends far enough to include all the members of the nation, and all of the national homeland. Again, in practice some of them always live on the wrong side of the border. Part of the national homeland may be there too, and it may be governed by the wrong nation. The response to the non-inclusion of territory and population may take the form of urdentism, demands to annex unredeemed territory and incorporate it into the nation-state. Irredentist claims are usually based on the fact that an identifiable part of the national group lives across the border. However, they can include claims to territory where no members of that nation live at present, because they lived there in the past, the national language is spoken in that region, the national culture has influenced it, geographical unity with the existing territory, or a wide variety of other reasons. Past grievances are usually involved and can cause revanchism. It is sometimes difficult to distinguish urdentism from pan-nationalism, since both claim that all members of an ethnic and cultural nation belong in one specific state. Pan-nationalism is less likely to specify the nation ethnically. For instance, Variants of Pan-Germanism have different ideas about what constituted Greater Germany, including the confusing term Grossdeutschland, which, in fact, implied the inclusion of huge Slavic minorities from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Typically, irredentist demands are at first made by members of non-state nationalist movements. When they are adopted by a state, they typically result in tensions, and actual attempts at annexation are always considered a casus belli, a cause for war. In many cases, such claims result in long-term hostile relations between neighboring states. Irredentist movements typically circulate maps of the claimed national territory, the greater nation-state. That territory, which is often much larger than the existing state, plays a central role in their propaganda. Urdentism should not be confused with claims to overseas colonies, which are not generally considered part of the national homeland. Some French overseas colonies would be an exception, French rule in Algeria unsuccessfully treated the colony as a department of France. It has been speculated by both proponents of globalization and various science fiction writers that the concept of a nation-state may disappear with the ever-increasing interconnectedness of the world. Such ideas are sometimes expressed around concepts of a world government. Another possibility is a societal collapse and move into communal anarchy or zero-world government in which nation-states no longer exist and government is done on the local level based on a global ethic of human rights. This falls in line with the concept of internationalism, which states that sovereignty is an outdated concept and a barrier to achieving peace and harmony in the world. Globalization especially has helped to bring about the discussion about the disappearance of nation-states, as global trade and the rise of the concepts of a global citizen and a common identity have helped to reduce differences and distances between individual nation-states, especially with regards to the Internet.
The theory of the clash of civilizations lies in direct contrast to cosmopolitan theories about an ever more connected world that no longer requires nation states. According to political scientist Samuel P. Huntington, people's cultural and religious identities will be the primary source of conflict in the post Cold War world. The theory was originally formulated in a 1992 lecture at the American Enterprise Institute, which was then developed in a 1993 foreign affairs article titled The Clash of Civilizations, in response to Francis Fukuyama's 1992 book, The End of History and the Last Man. Huntington later expanded his thesis in a 1996 book The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order. Huntington began his thinking by surveying the diverse theories about the nature of global politics in the post-Cold War period. Some theorists and writers argued that human rights, liberal democracy, and capitalist free market economics had become the only remaining ideological alternative for nations in the post-Cold War world. Specifically, Francis Fukuyama, in The End of History and the Last Man, argued that the world had reached a Hegelian end of history. Huntington believed that while the age of ideology had ended, the world had reverted only to a normal state of affairs characterized by cultural conflict. In his thesis, he argued that the primary axis of conflict in the future will be along cultural and religious lines. As an extension, he posits that the concept of different civilizations, as the highest rank of cultural identity, will become increasingly useful in analyzing the potential for conflict. In the 1993 Foreign Affairs article, Huntington writes, Sandrich Warman suggests that Huntington may be characterized as a neo-primordialist, as, while he sees people as having strong ties to their ethnicity, he does not believe that these ties have always existed. Historians often look to the past to find the origins of a particular nation-state. Indeed, they often put so much emphasis on the importance of the nation-state in modern times, that they distort the history of earlier periods in order to emphasize the question of origins. Lansing and English argue that much of the medieval history of Europe was structured to follow the historical winners especially the nation-states that emerged around Paris and London. Important developments that did not directly lead to a nation-state get neglected, they argue. <laughs>